Watching us trampling on the stones It's us down, down to the bone Blood is thick, waters were known well Cousins were kept apart, mothers were off Memories, fathers were not favorites on the farm For he could do some harm, he could wreck the master scheme For he, brothers, could dream Your mama ain't no saint, your daddy died in a shallow street But your uncle, Dr. King, did have a dream, my brother And what is your real excuse, why can't you study your lessons and stay in school? Why can't you study your lessons and stay in school? Free love and sex ain't nothing but a game Don't never last, try hope, take a chance on love Register to vote. Money ain't everything, but you could buy her a ring. Listen to little blackbird sing. Buy you a record of a yard bird with wings. Get into the swing of things. Oh boy. Buy some tenderness for a change. Home is where your history is, and it's not too late. Your uncle Dr. King wrote a book called Why We Can't Wait. Birmingham was yesterday. The mad dogs, the mad dogs came to call on your mother's mother and sister. Homeboy by Sunchi Ali. Welcome to the Coomran Report. May the peace and blessings of the life-giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. My name is Melvin Ishmael Johnson, coming at you live from Morris Media Studios. Our call in number is 1-323-293-3375. This week on the Coomran Report, we would talk about the black Greeks in the black community with the playwright, director, and cast of George Corbin's play, The Daughters of the Cush, which opens at the Stella Alla Theater, Friday, October the 13th, and run Friday, Saturday at 8 p.m. and Sunday at 3 p.m. and ends its run on Sunday, October the 29th. The Stella Alta Theater is located at 6773 Hollywood Boulevard, 90028. Ticket information and reservation, 1213-908-5032. Let me just say welcome to the Coomran Report. Thank Thank you for having us. Thank you. (laughs) Now, before we get into our discussion about the black Greeks and the black community, I would like to talk to you about this play, um, (laughs) The Daughters of the Gush. George, why did you write this play? Well, I wrote this play because I was intrigued by the challenge of what I consider one of the most important black institutions, namely the black fraternity or black sorority, being challenged by internal uh, conflict. And uh, what triggered it specifically was the horrific incident about 11 years ago where a black sorority pledge drowned in Long Beach in a hazing ritual. That alone didn't trigger the idea for the play. What intrigued me was the police detective in the article in the paper talking about his experience dealing with hardened gang members and trying to get them to crack and open up about their gang members, he had a harder time dealing with the sisters of the sorority in giving up their sisters, in effect. And that that got me going down the road of uh, what about the internal ethical and moral challenges that we as African Americans may have on occasion uh, within institutions we love and feel do really good work, mm-hmm. not only then, but today. Let me, let me ask you this, George. What is the message you hope to leave with the audience? 
about to, from this play? Well, the key message, I hope, uh, I'm not quite sure I want it to be a message. I want the audience to leave arguing or discussing th- the ethical challenges one might have. What would I have done as a member of uh, a black organization given those circumstances? Mm -hmm. What are the hierarchies of our value system? Mm -hmm. uh, Let me ask you this. Now, you got involved with uh, playwriting as a second career. Uh, can you talk a little about how you got involved with play, play, <laughs> as a player? Yeah, I want to know that too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> technically, I retired in 2004, mm-hmm. and I started teaching a college class. I had a long business career, had Zippo background in writing, plays, or any of this. But I had this idea that I wanted to write a play about actually a black fraternity meeting in Africa years after they graduated. And I called it New Man. And I wrote it. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. (laughs) But I enjoyed the process, Uh, the imaginative aspects. So uh, I stumbled upon the Roby Theater Company, and I kind of pushed the play into the hands of Ben Gallery, the artistic director, saying, Mm -hmm. take a look at this. Of course, he looked at me like I was crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Who who are you? What have you written? And he suggested that I get involved in In, the playwrights workshop for five or six years. Every Saturday, there I was to learn the craft. Okay. Oh, wow. Now, now uh, Veronica, um, let, let's talk about well, what is the biggest challenge in directing a play like this for you? That's a big question because everything is a challenge mm-hmm. because I'm so excited about this piece. I think one of the biggest challenges for me is to try to be as accurate as possible in treating the uh, sorority organization as one that has a strong foundation founded on Christian principles. And I want to make sure that um, within the playwright's limit and within reality that everything is the way it should be, especially because this is a period piece. Mm Mm-hmm. And the slightest little thing like a pair of black shoes may not reflect that. So I, I want to be as authentic as possible. That's the challenge. Not even the actors, because we have a, a wonderful group of people who pick up uh, directions very quickly and are very open. Um, the first day that I, the first rehearsal that we had. To my amazement, I found myself giving a history lecture to this generation (laughs) of kids. And uh, they all, all at once, took out the notebooks and pencils and they just started writing everything I said. And then they came back the next day and said, I did this. I watched that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I gave, you know, I gave them a little, a little homework assignment. They came back. So. And everything is gelling. I don't even have to tell them that the story centers around the bonding of these sisters. And like George said, so tightly that they won't give up either one. Well, I didn't even have to discuss that. They did it as women. They did it on their own. Let me me ask you this. Um, Now, your involvement, when you first came in contact with the theater, was it as an actor, director, writer? It was an actor, as an actress. And, and how yes. did you get involved in directing? Well, I got an MFA from um, an MFA in acting from New York University, and uh, I held on to it for a while. I didn't use it, mm-hmm. and I came out here in 1989 and started teaching for LA Unified School District. 
got introduced to Town Street Theater, uh, L.A.'s premier African-American theater, and we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, next year in 2018, which is a milestone for a black organization as well. And by being in the company, I just went in there to act. I then became the company manager. And with the blessings of the artistic director, Nancy Cheryl Davis Bellamy, I was given the opportunity to direct, whether it was a reading, or that's how I got involved. And plus the fact I did a lot of directing for L.A. Unified School District as a a, a theater teacher. Do you remember your first um, full-scale directorial project? Yeah, it was a long time ago in New York. (laughs) And then when I got here in California, um, every every single year I was participating in the 10-Minute Play Festival. And I did uh, the reading of this particular play twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, I had a very strong connection to this piece as I had a very strong connection to George's Caribbean piece that I directed prior. Yeah. Well, let me me ask you this. What do you think is the importance of black Greek sororities and fraternities uh, to the black community? Um, um, Their their stronghold on being community-minded, very active in, in social activism, um, which is something I'm very, very proud of. Um, when I first came here and got involved with the Pasadena chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, I was amazed at the various uh, committees they had, like education, like uh, um, political action. And these women were so strong and involved in everything. It was just so many things to be involved in. And they literally pulled me in to Mm -hmm. experience those things that I I hadn't even thought about. Um, And as a result, I came out with a very strong sense of stronger, really. I was never politically active. Mm -hmm. But uh, I came out with a strong sense of community as Mm -hmm. a result taking that sense of community into Town Street Theater, where there's a very strong bond there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I learned an awful lot just being in a community. A lot of people think they get the degree and they know how to act or they get a degree in whatever, even if it's a lawyer and they're ready to do their job without realizing that the real Mm -hmm. learning is in the uh, field. A city like Los Angeles, which um, the homeless uh, uh, situation really impact the black community. You know, here you probably got about 10 percent um, African-American uh, uh, that make up the city of Los Angeles. But when you look at the overall homeless population, probably about 95, 80, 95 percent down in the uh, Skid Row area. It's African Americans. How can, um, uh, like, Greek sororities and fraternities, how can they get involved with that? How can they have some kind of impact on that? Well, I think uh, there's evidence of that already. If you look at some of our key leaders, whether in the church, like Reverend Chip Murray, Mm -hmm. extremely influential, still involved Mm -hmm, after mm -hmm. all of these years, committed to challenges like the homeless, Uh, our president of the supervisors, Mm -hmm. another member of Alpha Phi Alpha, my fraternity. One of the key ways is having men and women who have that firm belief in the importance of their sorority or fraternity and apply it in terms of developing policies and budgetary elements that impact 
the homeless. The, okay. Yep. Let me uh, – um, uh, I have a question for Kurt uh, and George and Veronica. But before I ask this question, I would like to read something about the founder of the first black sorority, Elta Hedgeman Lyle. And um, uh, you see that we're going to project an image of her so you see how she looked. Elta Hedgeman was born in 1887 in St. Louis, Missouri. Elta Hedgeman Lyle uh, was a founder of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sororities, a.k.a. at Howard University in 1908. It was uh, the first sorority founded by African-American college women. Lyle is often referred to as the guiding light for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. We're going to project an image of her up on the uh, um, uh, uh, the screen. Uh, she had a 40-year career as an educator and was active in public life. She was a national treasurer of the sorority for more than 20 years. Elta Hedgeman Lyle chartered and was the first president of Amigo Amigo, its first alumni chapter, first alumni chapter uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She also founded the West Philadelphia chapter of the League of Women Voters and the Mothers Club in the city of uh, Philadelphia. In 2000, uh, the Elta Hedgeman Lyle Academy, a charter school in St. Louis, Missouri, was founded in her honor. The question uh, that I would like to uh, ask uh, and want to ask Kirk. We last uh, in our last show we talked about the divine nine, and uh, I noticed that five of the nine were started in the D.C. area, and you had an interesting uh, theory about why. Can you talk about that? All when right. You- hey, hey, everybody. Good, good morning. <clears throat> good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, last time uh, we talked about this, I uh, I phoned in. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned that uh, <clears throat> you had segments of the black population in the south and segments of the black population in uh, your big cities, New York. And then there was also a, a fairly large population in Baltimore and in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm going to plug a book because I haven't read it yet, but I found some information on <laughs> while I was uh, just reading, reading an outline on the book, and it's called The Original Black Elite, and it's by uh, Elizabeth Dowling Taylor. And in this book, she brings out the information that uh, in the turn of the century, there were more free, well, uh, more black people in Baltimore than any other city in the country, and then there were a, a, a large segment of a black population in Washington. I, I think we tend to forget that, uh, okay, a civil war was fought. Well, let's not look back at what happened to the Indians or what happened to the Japanese Americans or Muslim Americans, all of that. But after the Civil War, we had Reconstruction. And in Reconstruction, you had black senators in, con- mm-hmm. in, in, your, in, your, in your government. You had black uh people in the House of Representatives. Mm-hmm. You had black county judges. And so that basically was in 1877. I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a date mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, that was your basic foundation. You had Reconstruction. They, you know, the, the American government said, hey, we're going to not, we're taking this thing and we're going to make it the way it should be. And for about 30, 40 years, it worked perfectly well but uh during uh during the civil war after the civil war before the civil war you still had black populations in baltimore and in washington Mm -hmm. so i think that was what you were addressing to uh there were they were exposed to a black well a white elite because you're in Washington, D.C., and you're in Baltimore, and there was a, an ample amount of employment 
to go around. And in this book, she mentions that one of the the relatives, well, the head character, Daniel Murray, was a second uh, administrator in the Library of Congress. You know, and he dealt with the congressmen and uh, legislators and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And you had this exposure, this mixture going on until roughly, let's say, uh, when Woodrow Wilson became president. Like and segregated, I, and everything. segregated everything. Yeah, so, so, so what we're saying here is that um, uh, because the prior segregation – and the educated elite around the Washington area had a chance to observe the white sororities and fraternities that they mm-hmm. basically patterned. Uh, mm-hmm. exactly. I, 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 yeah, I know the um, uh, uh, the first fraternity by Minton, he said that he patterned his after the one at Yale, mm-hmm. uh, Skirl and Bones and all that kind of stuff. Like, Yeah, okay, I thought that was an interesting uh, thing. I just thought it was so interesting to... Uh, to see him, especially around Howard University at the time, because Howard University was one of the um, last black schools to um, to switch from a white president to a black president. Well, right? that took a long time. Very long because, time. Because um, mm-hmm. there is a documentary on the history of Delta Sigma Theta, and um, Delta Sigma Theta broke off from the AKAs. Mm -hmm. and form their own as a result of forming Delta Sigma Theta. They even got charted before the AKAs. Mm -hmm. And what they were saying was that they did not have a black president of that school until around the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Not only that, they had been um, advocating for a dean of women. They didn't even have a dean of women in 1919, 1920. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first deltas later on in the 1930s became the first dean of women. Mm -hmm. So they talked about how being on the college campus at the the inception of uh, Howard, right up until they got the first black president, it was like being on a glorified plantation. Yeah. Because it was a school founded for mm-hmm. uh, free blacks, actually, because it was founded before the civil rights. I mm-hmm. mean, before the Civil War. And so all the administrators were all white. Okay. Can I, can I go back mm-hmm. and tag a little bit on this? Um, well, my mother went to Howard, but we won't go into all that. Mm-hmm. He, Again, with this the situation in Washington, uh, by nineteen oh, I think about nineteen oh four, nineteen oh six, Teddy Roosevelt was president. He invited Booker T. Washington to yeah. his, to, to the White House for dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometime after that, the uh, by then the KKK, your fanatical racist groups, were leaning strong enough. That you didn't see any any black persons get invited to dinner to the White House for quite some time, mm-hmm. and by uh, um, again by the time that Wilson became president, I it just, just you know this is just an it's an insult and an irritating point. He shows birth of the nation mm-hmm. yeah. in, the, in, White, the, White in the White House, and yeah. then two years later he sends black men to go over and fight right. Germans in France. Yeah, he was he was definitely. Let me, let and me. if I remember correctly, he mm-hmm. resegregated the, the whole. He resegregated. The government. He resegregated oh, the government. The government. They right. And that's when they. Yeah. That's when they had. Mm-hmm. Then they start putting for yeah. colored yeah. only yeah. signs. Yeah. Let me let me um um put I'm I'm going to project a picture of Alta Hedgeman Lyle, who founded the AKA. So we mm-hmm. have a little glimpse of um her at Howard University during that time. Very, which, which I found very interesting, and uh, sometime in the future I want to do the founders also of the uh, 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 deltas and mm-hmm. and how that happened. I have a few. Yeah. Can I? I like yeah. to ask George a few questions. Yeah. Um, when you are in a fraternity, <laughs> yes. Do uh, are you asked to join the fraternity, or do you go to the fraternity and <laughs> say I would like to join? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> depends on the time period 
Um, I became a member of, of Alpha Phi Alpha at Penn State, <laughs> a university in the news, um, in 1961. At that time, I was solicited. I was approached, mm-hmm. saying, yes. you look like you might you actually might study. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, th- I think we better get these. Um, uh, yeah, let me. Um, uh, 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 I would like to bring in some of the cast members from the Daughters of the Cushion. While we set up, I'm going to play a short four minute clip from a f- uh, financial workshop held by Reverend E.J. Pierce at the Vortex for veterans and non veterans yesterday, September the 20, 2017. So while we play that clip, we're going to bring the actors in and set them You're up. You're going to be seeing some wonderful acting people. Yeah. Fantastic actresses. Excuse me, actors. Yeah. Hey, welcome to the Coon Brown Report. This is uh, Melvin Ishmael Johnson. I'm over here at the financial workshop. Uh, my econ. I'm getting ready to have a little short interview with Reverend E.J. Pierce. Just got a couple little questions to uh, ask him. Very first one is, what is the key element in attaining financial success? Thank you. That's a very good question. One of the key elements in financial success is strategy. See, most people say, I have to go back to school because they feel inadequate. So the strategy to go back to school has not been fulfilling because many of us go back to school again and again and again. The strategy that my econ talks about is using a strategy versus a sale. We've all been taught, go to school, get a good education so you can get a good job. Well, the strategy in that technique, that modality that we've all been taught about is good. But who is it good for? It's good for the government because jobs are taxed at the highest level. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, look, Sam, and this, for those who, uh, quickly, can you tell me how you got started in the financial uh, workshop, financial business, doing workshops like this? I got involved when I became a displaced worker in the workforce as an employee. And it was such a traumatic event because my lifestyle changed immediately because I didn't have the income that I used to have. So I wind up going into psychotherapy. And my therapist asked me a question. What's wrong with your mind? And when the thought came to me that my parents always told me, respect your elders, So I decided that since I'm a displaced worker, there's nothing wrong with my mind. I created a nonprofit organization called Senior Solution Outreach Program. And from there, I realized that the seniors used the strategy back in the day. They bought land, they bought property. You didn't know who was wealthy in the community because it wasn't about bling bling. Mm-hmm. It was about a man and a woman providing for their family and being able to pass on those assets to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but tell me, for those who would want some personal coaching or uh, to set up one of your workshops, how what's the contact information? For those who are interested in financial literacy, financial education, I don't charge personally. But what I do is, is that I find out what people want and I find out who has it 
and I bring them together. That's the purpose of Senior Solution Outreach Program. And Senior Solution Outreach Program is a 501c3, which is nonprofit. So we do accept in-kind donations. Mm -hmm. Our phone number is 310-770-7104. Mm-hmm. Give me a call, and I will be able to point you into the right direction. Because mm-hmm. as it has been said before, you can learn a lot from a dummy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Looking forward to this um, uh, workshop. Thank you very much. This is Melvin Ishmael Johnson with the Coombran Report. Okay, we're back live, and here we're sitting with the cast and the director of uh, the Daughters of the Cush. Daughters of the Cush would open at the Stella Alla Theater Friday, October the 13th and run Friday and Saturday at 8 o'clock, Sunday at 3 o'clock. It ends its run on Sunday, October the 29th, 2017. The Stella Alla is located at 6773 Hollywood Boulevard, 90028. Ticket information and reservation 12139085032. Let me just say again, welcome to the Coom Round Report. Let's go around and start with the actors. Um, tell me your name, the role you play, and how did you get involved in theater? Let's start over Okay, here. hi. I am Hannah Mae Sturgis. I'm playing the role of Kathy. And I started theater at a very young age. I've always had the bug. I was such a ham growing up in talent <laughs> shows and um, community theater. So I started as a munchkin in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I am Charlotte Evelyn Williams, and I'm playing the role of Rhonda. And uh, similar to Hannah Mae here, I started off very young. I uh, first found my love for it doing church plays, playing Mary, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> playing the mother of Jesus. <laughs> and, um, and then I... I, I <laughs> found a love for it and you know wanted to expand so I went to, to middle school where I did theater and then I went to Los Angeles County High School for the Arts where I studied theater and it's just been a part of me since I can mm-hmm. remember mm-hmm. <laughs> well let me let me uh, before we so we're gonna uh, do a couple scenes but before the director set the scene let me ask you this what do you think uh, what is the importance of the black Greek sororities and fraternities to the black community Mm-hmm. Community as a whole. What are, what are your yeah. Thoughts? Well, one, I think it's what you just said. It provides a community. It mm-hmm. provides a, a sense of of unity and sisterhood and brotherhood, and a support system. Um, you know, with with African Americans, it's so important that we build each other up mm-hmm. and that we. Um, support one another and nourish each other's ideas and that's what sorority and fraternity that's what they do and mm-hmm. so that's why it's important like they they can't be eliminated because you have a sister who is 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 your sister you know <laughs> until mm-hmm. the the day you die mm-hmm. that is believing and in, in supporting you mm-hmm. and um that's the importance of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also i think it's really important um in the collegiate years to have that as well um during the for the sorority for the sisterhood aspect of it um when the women's when the women's march was going on and um about you know women's rights with the women's rights movement and whatnot even then though both black and white were uh, pursuing you know the right to vote and all of that among the women alone, there was still segregation. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really important to to really include and to have, even though we're all women, too, it's like even that was divided. Mm-hmm. So to cling to that group, yeah. your sisters, was really support, really what, important. What, 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 what do you consider the biggest challenge in uh, interpreting this role, your role? Well, I think it's there are so many layers with Kathy. There are so many levels. Um, she's a part of, you know, she has a, a backstory of her of her family, and then being raised by my by adoptive um, African American parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just all the complexities in that, and to make it real, uh, mostly it's just about human connection. I think, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well. Yeah, for me with with Rhonda, I love Rhonda because she she's the big sister who wants to to support the little sisters, and she she loves being with them. Um, mm-hmm. She Rhonda, sh- she's in so many different organizations on her campus. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she likes to keep busy, um, and and that's what I think grounds Rhonda. She has such a, a, a lovely moral aspect about her, and for me the. 
I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a, a challenge, mm-hmm. um, but I, I just love Rhonda because she, <laughs> yeah. she's, she's I love that, Rhonda yeah, too. You, you just love Rhonda. <laughs> she, loves she's, Rhonda. she's, she's, she's funny. She has, you know, the humor side, but she's also really smart and intellectual. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she has, she has morals and values that, that matter to her. Mm-hmm. And, um, I say she's a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and you can see that I got my shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Veronica, tell us what scene uh, we're getting ready to hear, and can well, you set the scene? Yes, uh, the scene is Act One, Scene Five, and it takes place in Kathy's dorm room uh, <laughs> as she has invited Rhonda to her room to ask her to sponsor her uh, as a pledgy in the Daughters of the Cush, although. The deadline has long passed, and mm-hmm. a line has already been created. This young woman wants to still pledge and pledge now. <laughs> and, and this is the only to, uh, Rhonda to try to figure a way to get her mm-hmm. on okay. that line. And right. this is the only Negro sorority on campus. Okay. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and I want to join. <laughs> All right, we're ready. Yes. All right. <laughs> you made a good point. Bob's suggestion for our project was dumb like him. <laughs> Can you imagine if he was our president? Mm. Rhonda stops and looks around the dorm room. She walks over to the small balcony to take in the view and slides open the door. She disappears for a few seconds. Her voice can be heard. Wow, you have a great view. <laughs> I can see downtown from here. Rhonda appears from the balcony. Mm. Yeah. These old tower dorms are the only ones with balconies. Mm. Just put your books on my desk. Kathy drops her books on the bed haphazardly, anxious to please her guests. Isn't it great? I was lucky to get a room on the eighth floor. Mm -hmm. Lucky, that is, until the elevator goes on the blink. (laughs) No real complaints, though, and the phone's pretty close, too. Rhonda places her books on Kathy's desk, removes her coat, then notices a framed photo of Kathy at her high school graduation with an older black couple who are embracing Kathy. Rhonda picks the photo up to more closely examine it. Who's the Negro couple? Friends of your parents? Kathy gets up from her bed, goes over to Rhonda, and takes the framed photo from her hand and looks at it and smiles. No, better than that. My adoptive parents. Mom and Pop's battle. Adoptive parents? How come you didn't mention them before? Didn't have any reason to. Kathy picks up another frame photo of her at 12 with her biological father in his Air Force uniform. She speaks with obvious pride. This is my dad. Pop's retired. David Greenberg. He was a jet mechanic master sergeant. I was an Air Force brat. We were stationed all over. Plattsburgh, New York, Cheyenne, Wyoming, even Spain. Mm. Wherever there was a SAC base. Sorry. Strategic Air Command. That's where our nuclear bombers are based. Huh. You're really into the military thing. (laughs) Air Force. Oh, sorry, officer. But what? (sighs) My dad and pops were best friends. Really close. Both were sergeants. Mom died when I was four. Dad raised me until he was diagnosed with cancer. Oh. What happened then? It was a bad few years. Hmm. Anyway, I stayed with the battles while he was in the hospital. It was like my second home since I spent so much time over there. And when Dad realized that he wasn't going to make it, he asked them to adopt me. Wow. That had to have been rough. It was. But Dad got an attorney and went through the process. I was only 13. The battles didn't have any kids of their own, so it worked out great. I got to continue living in the world I knew, staying on base, continuing to attend my school, but most important, being raised by my adoptive parents, whom I had grown to love. There. That's about it. Reader's Digest version. Ah, (laughs) Reader's Digest leaves out all the real stuff. That's why it's so boring. Mm, Have to agree (laughs) with you on that. (laughs) Well? Well what? Well, it couldn't have been easy having to answer questions from the other school kids. How come your parents are Negro? Uh, Overall, it wasn't that bad. On a military base, we all live together and go to school together. Nothing is segregated. It's not like the outside world. Rhonda walks over to the Coltrane poster and studies it. (gasps) Like jazz? Uh, just a little Miles Davis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's the only one I would pay to hear live. Now, he's the cool one. And sexy as all get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must be a member of every organization on campus. What makes you say that? 
Well, when I checked you out in our yearbook, you were in practically every Plains Club and organization picture. I like to keep busy. But uh, why all the research on me? I invited you to my room so I could ask you in private. Ask me what? Ask you to become my sponsor. Hopefully. Sponsor you for what? Lambda Kappa Nu! I'd like you to be my sponsor. Oh, I should have guessed it. But why me? You are vice president of your chapter, someone with mm-hmm. influence. <laughs> I knew I needed someone with sand. Sand? It means courage. Uh-huh. One of Pop's favorite words. Hmm. Guys would say, he has balls. Oh! Same thing. <laughs> I'm not sure a girl would consider that a compliment. No, I meant it as a compliment. A strong woman like you. Hmm. So you want me to say yes right away? Um, But first, we need to talk a little bit more, okay? Okay. What other things would you like to know? Uh, Well, let's get to the big question. Why does a white girl want to join a Negro sorority rather than a black one? Kathy takes off her sweater and shoes, sits on the edge of the bed, draws up her knees, and puts her arms around them and looks at Rhonda. It comes down to a couple of things. First, I am most comfortable in black culture. It's a part of me. Hmm. I take pride (laughs) in it. My adoptive mother is a daughter of Cush. Howard, 1943. It would make Mom very proud if I were to become a daughter. I could see her big smile now. Lambda Kappa Nu is about giving back, serious stuff, not just partying, and that's important to me. Hmm. Comfortable. Enough to date a black boy in school? <gasps> that would be Benny. Oh. oh, I had a huge crush on him during my <laughs> freshman year. I had to beg him to take me on a date. Oh, you are just full of surprises. <laughs> so your mother encouraged? No, 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 not at all. She doesn't know. Huh. I want it to be a surprise if I were to be accepted. Hmm. You mentioned giving back, but we don't neglect the social aspect entirely. As you know, the daughters have a reputation for throwing a mean party. Oh, (laughs) don't get me wrong. If it was about service, I could join the Peace Corps. Mm. I love parties and dancing. Mm -hmm. Check out my 45s. Rhonda Mm. goes over to the desk and glances at the record titles. Let's see. Mm -hmm. What do we have here? Mm -hmm. The impressions. Ronnell's. He's so fine. Baby, be mine, Marvin Gaye. Uh-huh. Oh, you are in, Miss Battle, of your taste in music as part of the selection criteria. <laughs> I may want to borrow a few of these. Oh, help yourself. You're not trying to bribe me, are you? Maybe. <laughs> now, if I offered you one of my coal train... Oh, mm-mm, it wouldn't work. But if you were to consider making a little gift of this... She holds up a 35 record. <gasps> Hitchhike by mm-hmm. my man Marvin. Put it on. Put it on. Oh, great idea. We need a break from all this heavy conversation. <laughs> Rhonda puts on the record as the music starts. Kathy jumps up from the bed, goes over to the record player, and turns the volume until the sound is quite loud. She begins to hitchhike with great enthusiasm and skill. She waves Rhonda over to join her, which she does. They dance for a minute, attempting to outdo one another. Then there is a pounding on the door. They both stop dancing a little bit, but laugh as Kathy turns <laughs> off the record player. Turn it down. Some of us are trying to study. <laughs> That's Alice from across the hall. She's a real bitch. <gasps> down, girl. I see our future Air Force officer isn't all Miss Sweetness. Mm. And you can dance, too. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> mashed potato, locomotion, mm-hmm. and, of course, the Watusi. Oh, impressive. But I noticed you didn't mention the coffee grind as being part of your <gasps> repertoire. Oh, 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 we ladies of the South don't know anything, anything about oh. such unrefined behavior. Yes, yes. Besides, mm. when one is encased with gowns with hoops, well, my dear Le Grind, as you say, is just impossible for this beau regard. Oh, yes. Simply impossible, damn it. <laughs> you play whist? Doesn't everyone? Mm, check. <laughs> Why is whist so important? Oh, it is the number one recreational pastime of the daughters. Lots of late night girl talk. Is there anything I can do to make it easy for you to be my sponsor? Anything at all? Mm, not at the moment. Okay, okay. I'll be your sponsor. No need to keep you from losing sleep. <laughs> <gasps> thank you, thank you. Our line starts in the in the spring, so there's plenty of time. Oh, I. I was hoping... What's wrong? It's just that I was hoping to join the new line and not have to wait until next year. Why? Why did you wait so long to ask me to sponsor you? I could have gotten you started with the other candies. 
Well, it's just that I wasn't quite sure until that discussion we had at the student union the other day when I met Clara, your dean of pledges. She seemed so friendly and accepting. And I was hoping to surprise my mother over the Christmas break. I don't think... I... Oh, please. Please, is there any way you can make an exception? Okay, I'll... I'll talk to Brenda, our president. If she agrees, we'll have to check with National. They might approve since we have the minimum number of pledges for a line. If you were to lose a candy... <laughs> if this works, you'll be an exception in more than one way. See. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, let me ask you a good question. How do you, um, what is your approach to developing um, your ensemble for your actors mm -hmm. to move them in the direction of forming an ensemble? Mm -hmm. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> ask me the question again. <laughs> <laughs> what is your approach in developing your actors into an ensemble? Oh, boy, yeah. we've done uh, a number of things like um, getting them to uh, improv improvise, which mm -hmm. a, a lot of uh, directors don't like to waste time to do. But because there is so much group work going on and certain things need to be choreographed, mm -hmm. um, it allows them to work together and feel each other's rhythm on their own. Mm -hmm. And... Every time they come in, every every day when we get ready to rehearse, we walk into the room and people start greeting each other mm -hmm. like they haven't seen each other in six years. <laughs> you know, when it was last so, night, and everybody, <laughs> yeah, and so everybody's excited about about mm -hmm. the process, mm -hmm. and the process is going along without a hitch. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'll say something to somebody, and in Aidly they'll pick it up mm -hmm. without, well, that doesn't feel right. And then it's, mm -hmm. you know, okay. really a very great place uh, to work. Um, yeah. I wanted to get another, well, how long is the next scene coming up? The next scene, Do I believe, is even shorter than this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, very short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's very get the short. actors in here for that okay. scene. we got about five minutes okay. Okay. to Thank do this you. scene, and then <laughs> I want to do a Do we have here a chance for them yes. to get seated? In yeah, this? yeah, we're going to uh, talk while they get uh, seated and all that kind okay. of stuff like that. Oh, uh, we're going to need another chair because this is the one yeah, that has Yeah, we have a chair over, over there. So uh, give us, while, while they bring this chair out, um, give me the setting of this scene. We probably got about five minutes to read to, to do okay. this particular okay. scene because I want to have Hi. some time for the close Hi, out. welcome. Can yeah. Oh, you can sit mm -hmm. here because you can be in the middle. She's, I'm going yeah, yeah. to leave first. Yeah, sit she's got to mm -hmm. sit next Thank to you. her. Thank you. I yes. think I should be in the middle, right? No, okay. you leave and remember that there is a mm -hmm. conversation between her and... Yeah, so... Um, which, so say, which page is this? Okay, 53. So let's... Uh, um, We're doing this oh, so that's okay. Then yeah. she's still sitting right next to you. Yeah. Okay, so we got about five minutes okay, for the scene, so give us a setup. Okay, this is... Are you ready, Benoit? Mm -hmm. I have to wait for Benoit to get ready. Uh, mm -hmm. I am now. Oh, you squeeze. have to squeeze in. Uh -huh. Can you squeeze nice. a little? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. okay. Let's get rolling with the scene. We got about five minutes for the scene because okay. I'm going to do Benoit, a are you ready? close you out. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right. This is Act One, Scene Six, and they are in the sorority room mm -hmm. on campus. And we open up with. Uh, Kathy teaching one of the pledges Ida how to play bid whist okay. when big sister Clara the dean of pledges walks in on them. <laughs> okay. All right. And I will be reading the uh, stage directions for you guys. Okay, we're ready. Okay. Thanks for helping me learn how to play whist, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Big Sister Clara has insisted that all candies learn. Oh, don't worry. I'll teach you the way my mother taught me. It's easy. You'll learn in no time. I'm not so sure. I'm really bad at card games. Okay. What was the last card game you played? Uh, 
Go fish. <laughs> Whist is a lot more fun than go fish. Besides the playing part, you're expected to contribute fresh gossip. What's going on in the Negro world at Plains U? The funnier, the better. It doesn't necessarily have to be true, just so it sounds like it could be. Oh, I do know some stuff that might work. Good. Now let's get started. The first thing you need to know is that Whist is a game of luck, skill, and surprise. Oh. Four players, many different versions of the game. The daughters play Bid Whist. Okay. Now, the first step is you need to remove the ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. And there are a number of tricks. Well, what's a trick? What are you candies up to? Uh, candy battles. Help me learn how to play Whist. Where are you at on your project? You can return to your dorm now, Candy. I wish to speak with Candy Ida alone. Who came up with this idea, the Jackie Dolls? It, it was our new pledge, Kathy. She's really nice, really cool. We started to get together in her dorm room after classes. She's become the most popular candy. <laughs> it's kind of funny in a way. <laughs> really? What's funny? Well, we don't even notice any longer that she's white. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Uh huh. When she joined our pledge line last month, the Mrs. Kennedy doll was her first suggestion. All I could think of was a dumb bake sale. Clara looks at the doll in her hands and notices she has twisted off the head. Hands doll's torso and head to Ida. I'll, Sorry. I'll fix it, big sister. Ida successfully reattaches the doll's head and holds it up for Clara to see. There. You can put Kathy away. I'll meet you at the office at four. You just called the dog Kathy, big sister. Did I? Yes, big sister. Well, I meant to say Jackie. You can go now. Clara sits with her legs stretched out and stares, takes out a cigarette, lights it, and blows it out. Blows out a puff of smoke, clearly agitated. Scene. Okay, well, uh, we, we, we still got a, a little time. Before we close, so we've heard from everybody. Let me quickly hear from uh, Vanoa. We need to um, tell you the name, the role you play, and quickly tell us how you got involved in theater. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Vanoa Berno, and I'm playing the role of Clara in Daughters of the Cush. And I got involved in theater when I was in college at SMU, the Metal School of the Arts Theater Studies minor. A frat brother of mine was doing an August Wilson piece for a brown bag lunch, and I got to be a stage manager, help him out, got to peek in, piqued my interest, and then I just started staying involved with community theater on campus as well as Soul Rep Theater Company there in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Hmm. Now, what I want to do, we, we mentioned er earlier uh, Reverend Cesar Murray. I'm going to play a, a quick one-and-a-half-minute one clip from Reverend Murray uh, uh, about social engaging Christianity. And, the, and while we play that clip, I'd like to get George back up here because I want to get closing comments from George and the director. Thank mm -hmm. you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we're, looking forward, we're looking forward to this. Come on out and check this out. But you, can you tell, what is socially engaged Christianity? Socially engaged Christianity answers the question so often asked Jesus. Jesus, why have you come? I have come to help the helpless, to heal the sick, to lift the fallen, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. In other words, social gospel reaches beyond the walls of the church. In my 27 years at our city's oldest black church, we had a beyond the walls program, some 70 programs where each member of the church was asked to join one of the 70 task forces. Mm. So religion within the walls is not true religion until religion within the walls also becomes religion beyond the walls. Mm -hmm. Out of the community. Oh, 
Let's some comments from uh, the director, the playwright, and uh, Kirk over there. Quickly, we probably got a little less than a minute apiece. Well, I'd like to quickly say that I am very, very uh, proud and ecstatic over the work that these uh, women have been doing over the past three weeks. And I hope that everybody that sees this does come out and support our project and tell friends because we want to spread this not only within our local community but beyond. So, Mm -hmm. thank you. Very quickly, uh, I'm excited as well. I'm amazed how the actors keep discovering elements of my play. But I feel my play is timely. Things are going on in our world right now related to the Daughters of the Kush. So come out, enjoy, get engaged, and have a wonderful night at the theater. Mm -hmm. Uh, I uh, had the opportunity to produce a a reading of this play last year, and I want to tell you people to get off your behinds and come (laughs) and see it. It has pathos, tragedy, and comedy. It is more timely now than it was. It deals with a period of time that you probably... You're young folks out there. You don't know about the 1960s. It's a time of change. We already have a couple of shows that are sold out, so don't waste your time and think about it. This is a play that needs to be seen now. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Curry. Okay, so the um, Daughters of the Kush open at the Stella Allen Theater Friday, October the 13th. Runs Friday and Saturday at 8 p.m., Sunday at 3 p.m., ends its run on October the 29th. Stella Allen uh, is located 6773 Hollywood Boulevard, 90028. Ticket information, reservations, 213-908-5032. I would like to uh, extend a special thanks to... um, Playwright, director, the cast of George Corbin's uh, excellent play, The Daughters of the Kush. Also, um, we have our Nasana reading, our twice a month uh, Nasana reading, coming up this Wednesday at the Moments Playhouse, 665 Hellertrop Drive at 7 o'clock. T.J. Bay, uh, his play, uh, The Jumbo, Ojumbo. We'll we'll read that play this coming uh, Wednesdays. So uh, please listen to past shows of the Coomran Report by Googling in Coomran Report. Thank you for tuning in to the Coomran Report. And from your host, Melvin Ishmael Johnson, may the peace and blessings of the life-giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. I leave you with Homeboy by Sunji Ali. There's only one blood, cause it ain't no sense in us trampling on the stones. It's us, down, down to the bone. Blood is thick, waters were known well, cousins were kept apart, mothers were often memories. Fathers were not favorites on the farm, for he could do some harm, he could wreck the master scheme, for he, brothers, could dream. Your mama ain't no saint. Your daddy died.